aspects of interest. And what do you mean by precision medicine? So precision medicine is nothing but providing the right therapy to the right patient at the right time. And in fact, we doctors have been providing precision medicine to our patients for time immemorial. A classical example would be blood transfusions. We don't give the same sort of blood to every patient. We find out the patient characteristics in the form of the blood group and give the most appropriate blood to the patient. So what has happened now that precision medicine has entered into the limelight? For one, we now have tools that can delineate the characteristics of our patients, be it the biochemical characteristics, the phenotypic characteristics, or the genetic traits. And we also have the tools to interrogate this huge amount of data that we get by using these tools. So we are able now to subclassify our patients to decide what's the best treatment for them and put them all on a sound scientific setting. People often get confused between precision medicine and personalized medicine. So what is precision medicine and what is personalized medicine? Put it simply, precision medicine is the science and the personalized medicine is the art. You might find that a particular drug is the best option for a particular patient. So the patient is not able to afford that drug or he has some hang-ups or some preconceived notions about that drug by which he is not able to take that drug, then you can't use the drug in that patient. The best drug is of no use if it sits in the patient's cupboard. Or worse still, if it never enters the patient's home. So taking into consideration patient preferences and social context of the patient while applying precision medicine is what is known as personalized medicine. I won't be going too much into detail about that because that's the art of medicine which most of us are better exponents than I am. So how does this apply to diabetes? It was in the year 2018 that the American Diabetes Association put together a group, an interest group on precision diabetes and decided to formulate certain guidelines, to formulate certain steps by which precision medicine can be applied to the diabetes clinic. And thus far it has led to several publications in this field. One of these was an international perspective article which came in the year 2022 in which Dr. Mohan also was an author. And that has raised, in its wake, that has raised many more questions as to what are the opportunities, what are the future opportunities, what are the gaps, what are the problems that may arise when we apply precision medicine to the diabetes clinic. So in this talk, I will speak about the precision approaches to the various forms of diabetes, type 1, type 2 and monogenic diabetes as well as pre-diabetes. So how does precision medicine work in somebody with pre-diabetes? So we know that pre-diabetes like type 2 diabetes is not a homogeneous entity. The most basic way in which we can subdivide individuals with pre-diabetes is based on the pattern of displacement. You can have individuals with impaired fasting glucose and you have individuals with impaired glucose tolerance. And these two common forms of pre-diabetes differ in their pathophysiology, natural history and the response to the commonly recommended interventions. Now, impaired glucose tolerance is the most common form of pre-diabetes everywhere in the world except in our part of the world, in Southeast Asia. And it's characterized by a reduction in the insulin sensitivity in the skeletal muscle. The hepatic insulin sensitivity is either normal or only mildly impaired. And both the first and second phase insulin secretion are impaired in type. It has higher risk of progression to type 2 diabetes. And all the interventions which we feel are effective in pre-diabetes have mostly been tested only in individuals with type diet, exercise, metformin, what have you. IFG, on the other hand, is the most common form in India. Our prevalence of IFG is maybe two or three times higher than that of IGG. Here, the main defect is in the insulin sensitivity in the liver. The skeletal muscle insulin sensitivity is not affected. And in the first phase insulin secretion, that is more affected than the second phase. The risk of progressing to diabetes is slightly lower than that of IGT. But the unfortunate part is that most of the drugs and therapeutic interventions in the form of lifestyle that we try for pre-diabetes have not been shown to be useful in there are a couple of important points here in the sense that there is an increasing trend, especially in Western countries, 
not to do a glucose tolerance test for diagnosing diabetes in prevent. If you don't do a glucose tolerance test, you cannot diagnose IBM. You are only diagnosing people with IBM. And really, there is no evidence showing that intervening in individuals with IFG has any benefit in preventing the progression of diabetes. By all means, these lifestyle interventions are useful in improving the general health. But really, we do not have too much of evidence that it prevents the progression to type 2 diabetes. Going beyond that, this is a study from Central Europe, Germany, Tübingen, Wagner et al. And they have further subdivided individuals at high risk of diabetes by means of various tests like MRI assessment of body fat, peptide, glycemic levels and so what have you. And they have subdivided individuals with pre-diabetes into six clusters, just like you have clusters of type 2 diabetes, we have clusters of pre-diabetes also. And they found that three of these clusters, that is cluster 3, cluster 5 and cluster 6, were at high risk of progressing to type 2 diabetes. 3 and 5 had the highest risk, 6 had a slightly lower risk, 3 was characterized by high genetic risk, low insulin secretion, 5 was characterized by high liver fat and increased insulin resistance and these two had a highest risk of progressing to type 2 diabetes but cluster 6 which had high visceral fat, probably the risk of progressing to diabetes was not so high as in the other two clusters but they had higher risk of getting kidney disease and they had a higher risk of mortality. So this field is developing and it's not surprising that there are clusters of pre-diabetes because ultimately pre-diabetes is what leads to type 2 diabetes and we know now that type 2 diabetes has several subtypes. So that's what I'm going to talk about now. Now this is the well-known study from uh, Leaf Group's uh, team, MIL Kisteta, which is published in Lancet Diabetes and Technology 2018 in which they have classified individuals with clinically diagnosed type 2 diabetes into five clusters based on clustering of various phenotypic patterns. So you have a group which is autoantibody positive, which is probably undiagnosed or misdiagnosed type 1 diabetes, they called it SAID. There is a group with poor insulin secretion, they called it SID or severe insulin deficient diabetes. So there is a group with severe insulin resistance, they called it SERD. There are, there are two mild phenotypes, a mild obesity related diabetes and a mild age related diabetes. We tried to replicate this cluster in our clinic population, we found that the SID group and the mild age related group are more or less similar to that found in Europeans except that the mild age related group, the age was quite lower, which is not surprising since the Asian Indians tend to get type 2 diabetes at a younger age. But we also were able to find two novel clusters that is the insulin resistant obese diabetes and a combined form which probably has the worst of both worlds that is known as the combined insulin resistant and deficient diabetes. So these are two novel clusters. So what is the importance of this clustering? Ease of attaining glycemic targets. How easily you can get to HP1C target differs by subtype. And in general, the insulin deficient subtypes tend to reach the glycemic goal with much more difficulty than the insulin resistant and the mild subtypes. The risk of complications may vary by subtype. The deficient subtypes have a higher risk of retinopathy, while the resistant subtypes are more prone to kidney disease. There is also a possibility that they might respond differentially to anti diabetic therapy. We heard that there are now so many 12, 13 classes of anti diabetic agent. Which class works best in which patient? We may be able to find out by evaluating these clusters, interrogating these clusters further, but then again, that's a topic for a different talk. But please bear in mind, we are already following a precision approach in treating type 2 diabetes. This for the 2017 ABA guidelines on managing hyperglycemia and type 2 diabetes. And you can see here that here it was metformin, metformin, metformin for everyone without exception. Com contrast this to the 2024 guidelines wherein you have groups of people in whom the initial pharmacotherapy is a drug other than metformin, GLP-1 receptor agonist or an FGLT2 inhibitor. So already we have started adopting a precision approach in the treatment of type 2 diabetes. All that remains to be done is now trying and refining it further for patients who do not have any of these compelling indications. Is there an indication for giving one particular drug over the other? What about type 1 diabetes? Again, not very clear because we feel all type 1 diabetes are similar, all type 1 diabetes are not similar. They may vary in the number and type of auto antibodies. They can also vary in the presence or absence of residual beta cell function, which actually makes a big difference to the patient. 
if you have residual beta cell function, you tend to have a much easier journey with type 1 diabetes than somebody who does not. And until recently, there was no point in subdividing all these people. There was nothing you could do to them. See, what's the difference if you have autoantibody, you don't have autoantibody. Treatment is the same insulin. But now, there are treatments, targeted therapies available, which can slow down the progression of type 1 diabetes. Either from stage 2 to stage 3, or in early stage 3, there are therapies which can prevent the loss, further loss of beta cell function. We have the monoclonal antibody, that is teplizumab, JAK kinase inhibitor, that is diracetinib, and control of hundreds of good old casual channel blocker, Verapam. So we need to characterize our patients to decide who are the best candidates for these treatments. Because many of these treatments are expensive and they are not free of side effects also. So we need to give it to those people in whom the benefit will be the maximum. And finally, I will talk about in brief monogenic diabetes, which is considered as the poster child of precision diabetes. There are many clinical phenotypes of monogenic diabetes, and making an accurate di diagnosis may make a world of difference to the patient with that particular control. So, the first phenotype is that of neonatal diabetes, which is diabetes with onset below the age of six months or below the age of one year, and most of them have mutations in genes which encode the units of the ATP sensitive potassium channel and some of them may be able to be switched from insulin to oral subfold units, not all. We need an accurate genetic diagnosis. There are these people who have mild non-progressive fasting hyperglycemia that is due to mutations in glucokinase and many of them are on treatment unnecessary. And except in pregnancy you really need not treat these people because treatment is not needed, it is not effective also. And then we have all these transcription factor forms of monogenic diabetes, which present with progressive familial young onset hyperglycemia. Many of them can be switched to sulfonylurea if they are being treated out with insulin up at the age as diagnosed as type 1 diabetes. And of course, there are many syndromic forms. There is not much of benefit to the patient with respect to the treatment because most of them need insulin. But remember, in many of these cases, diabetes may be the first manifestation. So if you find out the genetic defect by means of next generation sequencing, at least you can help the family be prepared. You will know what to look for, prognosticate, and maybe also help in genetic counseling. So this is an example of a few patients with neonatal diabetes who were switched from insulin to sulfonylurea at our center. And you can see clearly here the sort of reduction of HPOC which you have got in these patients after starting the insulin. 16.6, 14.3 to 7. This sort of magical reduction in HPOC you will never get in any other form of diabetes. And the reduction in A1C is maintained. It's maintained over years. This is these are patients with KC and J11 variant, and these are patients with APCC8 variant. And data from Europe tells you that the response to sulfonylurea in these patients is maintained over a period of 15 years, unlike type 2 diabetes, where sulfonylureas are not a durable form of therapy. And this is one of Dr. Hattersley's case, which tells you if you do not give precision treatment, what happens? This was somebody with young onset diabetes who was doing very well with sulfonylurea for some weird reason. Dr. Hattersley says the patient was worried about weight gain, so they started metformin and see what has happened to the HPOC. It was three years before Weiser Council prevailed and sulfonylurea has restarted and the patient's HPOC came back to normal. And this tells you that you need to make the diagnosis as soon as possible. The later you make the diagnosis and the more hyperglycemia the patient accumulates before the diagnosis is made, the less effective will be the switch to sulfonylurea therapy. So you need to be aware of these situ conditions, you need to make an accurate diagnosis and switch treatment as soon as possible. So I'd like to conclude my brief talk by saying that precision approach has now reached a diabetes clinic. The poster child of uh, precision diabetes and where it is most applicable now is monogenic diabetes but which represents only a small proportion of individuals with diabetes even among young individuals. It's rolled in other forms of diabetes, they call it now aspirational because we wish we would have a precision approach but it's a castle in the air, it's still not there but it will be there very soon. So we need more research, we need more studies, big data needs to be analyzed to see how precision approaches can be used in most cost effective manner and we really don't want to widen the health disparities. We don't want people to say that without a genetic study we cannot treat a patient. 
or without a cluster we cannot. We need to have simple frequent variables by which we can subdivide our patients with diabetes and decide the best therapy for them. Thank you for your attention.